On this episode, Simic Cynic stops by. That was kind of cool, actually. <laughs> <laughs> This is Gary Vay Nerdchuck, and this is episode 226 of the Ask Gary V Show. I'm excited. I have a guest. I actually have a pretty serious focus on the fourth quarter here of not doing too many guests, uh, getting back to kind of the classic version, even India. Even India, Tyler, let's go, go. Even India is here, so we're going very classic on the, on the show, but I couldn't resist. Simon and I got some drinks together catching up. And, uh, I and I thought it would be fun to have you on the show. So many of uh, the people that watch this are huge fans of yours. Thank you. Um, many, you know, as these worlds work, many would be discovering you for the first time, which excites me. I'm excited to get that email, you know, nine months from now saying, thank you so much for introducing me to Simon. So there's a lot of selfish wants and needs here <laughs> in this episode. But Simon's a friend and somebody who I really enjoy spending time with even though we're both so busy that it happens infrequently. But to the, uh, the percentage of the audience that doesn't know who you are, why don't you give them a quick little spiel quick and then we'll, spiel. Uh, we'll answer some questions, my friend. Sure. Uh, my name is Simon Sinek and uh, I have a clear vision of what I want to build in this world. Uh, I imagine a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired to go to work feel safe when they're there and return home fulfilled at the end of the day. And everything I do, whether it's writing, speaking, teaching, whatever it is, is devoted to helping to build that world. And, do you, and have you always had that for yourself? Past decade. And before then? Uh, I would say I, my career before then was... Uh, what did you do before then? I had a marketing consultancy. Got it. Yeah, and marketing sort of, I just sort of me. I, I mean, I enjoyed myself. I had a passion for what I did, but I sort of <laughs> yeah. I meandered. Yeah. I would say that, you know, my, I think my goals and my visions were very much uh, about me and about the business. I want to build this kind of business. I want to make this kind of money. Yep. And that hasn't been for the past decade. And, and so me knowing a little bit more and adding a little more color for the group, you, mm-hmm. you speak, you've written books, mm-hmm. uh, you had a breakout speech mm-hmm. at, at, one of the, at the highest of levels. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah. I think that so a, a, a long time ago. Uh, I did uh, 2009. It's as long as, a, as long as goes. There are some older people that watch this. Right. 2009, I wouldn't consider so long ago. Oh, I think in this social media world, <laughs> Guys, it's a long, a time long, ago. long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Long you time know, ago. Seven years. I gave a, I gave a, <laughs> I gave a TEDx talk in Puget Sound, Seattle, and uh, it's gained some popularity on YouTube. And the folks at TED.com, at TED, decided to put it on TED.com, and. Uh, it, it went, went crazy. It went crazy. And uh, when did it go crazy? When did that? It, it you, happened. You, sp- you did it in 09. I did but it at when the end it co- of 09, and they put it on TED.com in May of 2010. Yeah, it, it seems. I mean, like it just seems like a lot of people have. How many views did that get? The last time I checked, it's about 27 or 28 million. Yeah, monster. Andy, what are you, you're slacking over there. I don't. I don't have any 28 million. <laughs> and so, and I, so. Look, I won. I won the internet lottery. I mean, you know. It, well, I, got, I mean, there I was. Got, I got it, lucky. It was. I got lucky. And for one more time, for the the people that are learning about you, what real quick on what was the general thesis of that? So I shared. Um, I shared as a talk on a theory that I continue yep. to espouse that I. Um, based on an idea I call the golden circle. Uh, basically, every single organization on the planet, every single one of us knows what we do the things we sell, the services we offer. Some of us know how we do it. It's the, uh, the things that we think make us stand out or differentiate us from the, the world outside. But very, very few of us can clearly articulate why we do what we do. Um, and if you look at the greatest leaders, everybody from Martin Luther King to Steve Jobs, those with the capacity to inspire action and those around them, every single one of them, regardless of their, of their industry, uh, thinks, acts, and communicates starting with why. Yep. Most of us talk about what we do. And then we try and tell people how we're better. But these guys talk about their vision, they talk about their cause, they talk about where they're going, and what they do simply serves as the tangible proof of what they believe. Um, And uh, it profoundly changed my life. Uh, It continues to be the way in which I uh, organize information, make decisions, set strategy, all of it. It's the North Star. It is the North Star. Um, And I found a language that 
made it really easy to understand. And actually, the cool thing is actually grounded in the biology of decision making. So it's not like some highfalutin management theory. Right. It's actually grounded in, in how the, the brain evolved and makes decisions. And what about your book world? You've written now what, three? Third book. Yep. Yeah, came out today. This is the day. This is the day. Is that what's in there? No. I was super pumped. I'm like, he's got a box. We sent you some. I know, but I lost it. You lost it, so yeah. you didn't even read it. No, read it? I've never read a, I've read like four books in my life, like Joe Namath, Life Story. You do realize like, it only has like 200 words in it. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of pictures this time, it right? It is a lot of pictures. So what are the three books okay, real quick? So the, the and we'll leave those up. And India, I think it's time for you to reassess and, and re-enter the ecosystem. I feel like, you know, talk, Dunk yeah. and Sid and all these characters, nobody can play up to the level of your quality and so I think we're ready to raise the bar. Ready. Yeah, ready. Yes, but before we do that, the three okay, books. First book. first book is Start With Why. Yes. Uh, which is deeper look into what I've talked about yes. on the TED Talk. Second book is Leaders Eat Last. Yes. Which is all about um, how, where trust and cooperation come from and how you build trust and you ever, cooperation. You ever consider calling it like leaders don't eat at all? Because that, that's that how sometimes I happens. That's how, that's that how sometimes happens. For a long time. Yeah, that's all very right. true. And this new one that and comes out today? And the new one today? that comes out to today is called Together Is Better. Okay. A little book of inspiration. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. And it's basically um, a beautiful little illustrated book with quotes and aphorisms, but it's a metaphor. Um, I tell a story of three little kids who are dissatisfied with their playground because of a bully, in this case, uh, the metaphor for being a bad boss, and people imagine having a different job or going somewhere else or starting their own business or whatever it is. Yep. And the question is, who has the courage to do that? Yeah. And so basically it's a story of three little kids who find the courage to follow their dreams because they learn to help each other. Love it. Yeah, that's what it's about. So all across America we hope, and the world, we hope to inspire people leaving organizations three at a time. Five at a time. Ten. Yeah, I'm good with that. Good. India, let's do it. <laughs> First one from oh, a lot of, these oh, are all real, videos, right? Real, oh, yeah, good. A video. Real questions. This good, I like this. Hi, Gary V. Hi, Gary V and Simon. I hope all is well. Question that I have for y'all is, can somebody's personal why on why they work for a business vary from the business's why? Or is that just never good? Thanks a lot, keep climbing. So if it's your business, uh, the business's why and your why are exactly the same thing. Yeah, but he's asking if he works for an he organization, works for he knows the organization's why. I mean, a lot of the people he here, knows the right? organization's why. A lot of them know why. Vayner's why, sure. but they may have separate whys within it. Can they coexist? Can sure. an employee's why and an org's sure. why coexist and everybody wins? Sure, uh, the simple answer is yes, if they go together. Um, everybody has their own unique why, and the organization has its own unique why. Yes. And if they are compatible, you mean go together in a peanut butter and jelly yeah, kind of metaphor? If they're compatible, okay. then you will look to the people who have joined the company and say, ah, you're a good fit, you belong here, and they will see themselves as a good fit, and each one is, is mutually beneficial. In other words, it's like any relationship. You know, you and your wife have different whys, but they're compatible. You see her as 100%. helping you grow, and she sees you as uh, helping her grow, etc. It's the exact same thing. Uh, which it's, is why. And sometimes it is incompatible. Just which like is people, why divorce rates like people, are very high. Which is, which, or people, well, I don't know. It's sometimes incompatible. That's a decision-making problem. Okay. Um, but but it's, an, it's also an evolution problem, right? Like, if you think about it, one's whys can be really aligned with the organizations today, and five years from now, they may not. No, absolutely not. Not if both organ. No, not One if more both time, you, you're saying no to that? No to that. So you're saying that there's a Here, frozen, let me tell you why. No, no, let hold me tell on, you before why. you do, I want to give you more framework yeah, yeah, because yeah. I'm fascinated by okay. your decision to say that. You're saying that things are frozen, frozen, and that one's context of how the world, of, for example, that it's so frozen, both yeah. North Stars, that one who's an employee who's rolling quite along and has a sure. why, but then child dies from cancer along yeah. the way, isn't reframed into the context of where maybe it's not aligned anymore. No, the, okay. it's, I, the word, I wouldn't use frozen. Okay. Uh, you're saying that there can be no growth when you use the word frozen. Okay. Your why is fully formed by the time you're in your probably late teens. And the rest of your life is simply an opportunity to live in balance with your why or not, so the uh -huh. decisions you make. And so what you're, whether somebody's living, that's why I said before, which is as long as both, organiza both organization and person are working hard to remain in, in consistent with, with their cause, then it, sh then it works fine. Now, the example you give of someone's child dying, yes. you know, tragedy doesn't form or change your why. Tra tragedy usually gives us an opportunity to live our why because it makes everything else in the world seem stupid. Yes. You know? And that forces us to say, there's something bigger and more important here. Very often, tragedy 
pushes us into why, not the other way around, not pushes us away from it. I totally agree with you. I think the most extreme things that happen in people's lives actually just accentuates the reality. It exaggerates of who you really 100%. are. It exact, you know, the, the test of someone is not when everything's going great, it's when everything goes wrong. That's yeah. where, you, where your true colors show. Or, or, the, <clears throat> or similar to that, but a slightly different version for everybody, I'm fascinated by uh, people's wealth and fame really not changing them at all, just finally exposing who they actually are. Yeah. And yeah. that, that's not a tragedy, and that, and that's, that's a hard thing. in theory a good thing. That's but, a hard thing. But it's a real thing. Absolutely. All right. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's fine if they're different okay. in, as long as they're compatible. And this is why you want to know your why and this is why you want to find out the company's why because otherwise you're going to make decisions based on money and benefits and then there's nothing. It's, it's like making a decision about who to marry based on the I, bank I, I don't want to sidetrack the show but it's, it's funny I'm sitting here. It's why I'm so confident in what I'm building at VaynerMedia because the platform is being built to be in their benefit to reverse engineer what they want based on their DNA whether that is enormous ambition which is then this is a platform for them to create that or within a yeah. very close ecosystem to me or quite passive and very nice work life. I have actual zero emotion one way or the other of what they actually want. I just want to build a framework sure and a platform it. that gives them those options and I think that's the great mistake that most businesses make. And isn't that what you preach in your work as well? 100%. So, so it's, yeah, it's, I have no interest in. So the in, why is clear internally and externally? 100%. I love that. Which is, you know, because to me otherwise everything crumbles in its hypocrisy if you don't do that. Amen. Matthew. Hey Gary, Matt LaMarche here in Atlanta, Georgia. Hope you're doing well. I had a quick question about self-awareness. Do you think it's more about maturity and wisdom or is it something that you're just built with? Thanks so much for taking the time. Have a great day. That's a good question. So I've been talking a lot about self-awareness. Yeah. I'd love for you to take the floor first. Uh, maybe you haven't had as much time to ponder this, this world. Um, what's your take on self-awareness? Do you, um, do you feel like you have it? Do you feel like it, it grew? Is it, you know, for example, I believe it is the ultimate power. Mm -hmm. Once you have that, mm -hmm. boy, can you start navigating. Mm -hmm. um, I'm struggling because so many people have really caught attention to this mm -hmm. and are asking me to help them figure out how to gain more of it. There's mm -hmm. certain places where your, your skill set stops. Mine stops at, how am I gonna, t I don't know. I, mm -hmm. Boy, do I know the people that I know that have it yeah. are winning. And, and not just financially or exposure, like they're just in a happy place yeah. because of that self-awareness. What is your thought on self-awareness? Yeah, I think it's a skill like any other. So uh, you do think it's something sure. that can I mean, be developed? Some people might have natural capacity for it, but however they were raised like any other skill, you know? It's like in the world. Some people are good at basketball and some people have to work very hard to be good at basketball. Yeah. But it's, do you think one caps out though? In the uh, basketball analogy, Dunk is a, is, a, is a nice looking athlete, but he's never going to be an NBA player. Right. He has a ceiling of his basketball skills. So, do you think people have a ceiling? I don't know if people have a ceiling. I don't know if people have a ceiling, but I think self-awareness is a skill, a practicable, learn, learnable skill. And I think the, the one, one of the big things about self-awareness is we don't really know how we're being perceived. We think we know how we're being perceived. Yes. And sometimes we act in a way, you know, when we, when we act all pompous because we want to appear strong, but we really, really we appear weak. And, That's right. You know. Um, you know, we're not always uh, which is a aware, common one, by the way. which is, yeah, right. And so I think the big thing about learning to be self-aware is being open to the feedback from people who love you and care about you, who are willing to say to you, when you said that, you looked and sounded like Yeah. Right? It's and, funny. And to be open to that kind of harsh, but from a good place uh, critique is the only way to learn how you, how you, you come across. It's funny you said that. I think the closest I've ever gotten to answer this is that and then comma, actually putting that inner circle in yeah. a safe place to yeah. tell you the truth. Exactly right. Because those same people are scared crap, you know, they love you. And if you're defensive the whole time, then, Game over. then, then you are not learning self-awareness. I would, I would tell you that my reading of comments over the last decade on social, and taking each with a grain of salt. Your biggest fans, you can only, you can only let your ego go so far. And you know, you, you're aware that some people troll for the sake of getting reactions from the community, things of that nature. But the net, mm -hmm. the millions mm -hmm. in a net composite score has definitely been, I would always say that listening has done a lot more uh, for me even though I love to talk and always talk. That consumption pattern the, it has been a very big deal So for there's me. a wonderful story Please. about listening. Okay. The problem when people say you need to be a better listener is we are human beings and we need to communicate and communication is two ways, listening and speaking. So the, the, so, but everybody's like, you gotta be a better listener. Like, 
but here's the best understanding I have of that. So Nelson Mandela is universally regarded as a great leader, which is important because you know different people are viewed differently in different nations. But Nelson Mandela universally regarded as a great leader, right? He was actually the son of a tribal chief. And uh, he was asked in an interview once, how did you learn to be a great leader? And he tells the story of how he would go to tribal meetings with his father. And he remembers two things. They always sat in a circle, and his father was always the last to speak. Hmm. And in terms of leadership uh, and listening, I think the idea of be a better listener is actually half the advice. I think the advice is practice being the last to speak. You see this all the time in meetings where everybody will sit around a room, the senior guy will be like, all right, here's the problem, here's what I think we should do, but I'm really interested in what your thoughts are. Yes. So let's go around the room. It's too late. You've influenced You've the room. You've created the and people, and it, p people bend and mold as opposed to saying, here's the problem, I'm interested in what you have to say without saying anything. And not even, and having this, and here's, this takes practice, not even, even giving a hint whether you agree or disagree. If anything, you ask questions to learn more, you get the benefit of hearing everybody's opinion, everybody gets to feel heard, and then you get to render your So opinion. I would tell you, and this is for people that are running businesses, that is a micro example of the way, I, which is, and I think makes a ton of sense. I, I would tell you, Andy, you obviously direct report to me, you run our team. I think people would be stunned by how little we talk at all. Like the, the level of micro, right? Like the level of micromanagement I put on, like my version of that is actually letting people do their thing and watching it from, speaking last. When I, by, I guess my punchline is by the time I get into the meeting where we're like, here's the problem, the, the amount of listening that has been done because I've created such a white canvas for the leaders to do their thing and I can watch it and contextualize what they're doing is the macro version. Because once you're in that meeting room, that's basically the, the, the final pitch of what's been going on over that period of time. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting. I believe in that quite a bit. Okay, good. I mean, I, I think, I, I on the other hand do think that all skills have a max out. At some level, your hard wiring, you know, but that, limits. So you can't, you can't continue to grow till the day you die? No, I think, I think that's the, the black and white version of that. Yeah. I think that you can continue to make incremental steps, mm -hmm. but I think that there are oh, people. Oh, so there's, there's a diminishing returns kind of thing. I believe, no, there, I believe that, because yeah. I believe some people are just delirious yeah. in this chase that they're gonna be at this upside of any skill, yeah, and it becomes and people lose practicality the, at some level. And the question is, is where is everybody? You know, if if, if here is the max out right. of the diminishing returns. That's right. The problem, is, the question is, is did you stop did, here? Does anybody yes. even get here? I mean, yeah. like the, you know, I think and, and most which, people and are which still is why, here. And which is why I'm always very careful to not play too much to the negative yeah. because I don't want somebody to stop here. Yeah. But at the same token, in a world where there's a lot of voices and everybody can do everything, yeah. we need to level some oh, level like of practicality. That. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, thank you. Bill. Bill. Hey, Gary and Simon. My name is Bill Clanton, BillClantonBooks.com. I'm an adult coloring book illustrator. I live here at the Jersey Shore. I make coloring books for grown-ups. Uh, up till now, I've been a one-man band uh, as far as controlling my operation and doing everything myself. Uh, but I'm looking to expand and start building a team. Uh, do you have any suggestions as I grow to help new team members buy into my why or my mission as to why I'm doing this? Is there any best practices or ideas, suggestions to help them buy into what I'm trying to accomplish here? Uh, any suggestions would be great. Uh, thanks a lot and keep up the good work. Yeah. Uh, any suggestions would be great. <laughs> sure. Well, what suggestions? One, well, yeah. well, well, one is having clarity of why which is um, somebody, you have to have the ability to talk about or uh, uh, what you believe, what you're trying to build beyond the business itself. So he's into adult coloring books. What specifically which is puts him, By the way, which puts him in a good spot to begin with, right? I mean, if you just think about that in thesis, yeah. there's a lot of like smiling that comes along with that. There's like a lot of it, positive it, it, vibes. If, if that's why he went into it. It could have been for some zen calm thing or some Or some weird thing. thing. Maybe he's a really bad guy and you he's know, trying to, so, he's so, mad at children. So I think, I don't think so, so. so but, but even beyond the coloring books, like what, what is it that he imagines, you know, the ability to talk about uh, his vision, and if he can't talk about his why in hard terms, can he tell stories of his own experiences or people he admires that if somebody hears enough of those stories they can kind of get a sense of who he is? Um, what you'll find is that, that um, the better you are at communicating your why, um, people will want to work for you uh, 
regardless of the opportunity that you afford them. Like, they want to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, we do a little thing, which we've been doing for years and years and years, called a give and take. Whenever there's any kind of relationship, whether it's a, 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 an outside partnership or even a, a, somebody who joins our team, we do something called a give and take, where we want somebody to be selfish and selfless within the relationship. So not give and get, but give and take. So we'll ask them, what is it that you have to give to us, that you have that you, you think that we need, right? And they'll tell us. And then we'll say, great. What is it that you selfishly want from us? And we want them to tell us what they can get from us and no one else. I believe in that so much. And when those, when those things match, you have a balanced relationship. Because, so for example, I'll, I've had it with people, who, you know, they'll tell me what they, what they have to offer and that's awesome because that's what I want. And then they'll say what they, have, what they want to take and they go, oh, I want to work with uh, smart people. I'm like, plenty of smart people. What is it you want to take from me? They're like, oh, I want to help build something. Wonderful, do that anywhere. What do you want to take selfishly from me that you can get nowhere else? And if they can't answer the question, I won't engage in a relationship. And the reason is because in time, the relationship is unbalanced. They're going to be giving, but they're not taking. And I don't even know how to give them what they want. Then they'll complain they're not making enough yep. money or that yep. because it's not balanced. That's right. And I think, so I that's, think, that's a big I think, part of it. I think the other thing you know as being out there, a lot of people play, a lot of people play uh, the reverse of that. Yeah. You know, they want to give you something that is very low in value and they want something insane. In ret- hey Gary Vee, I tweeted about your book. Now, I want a job with you. I want you to babysit my dog four times a week. Like, like it's insane with it's that. A, right, so it's about balance. And to me, I've thought a lot about that. I think a lot about it. I, I call it 5149. I fully believe in that. Yeah. And then what I always think about is, how incredibly important it is to me to slightly give a little bit more, not because I'm the greatest human ever, I actually yeah. just think it's a leverage point. I think it's, like, I like the feeling, and, yeah. and I'm not sold that, I don't know if that makes me a good guy or a bad guy, it's just my, it's my natural state yeah. to slightly over deliver yeah. as close to the middle as possible, and I, I like that. So one of the richest guys in China, he might even be the richest, well, since the Alibaba guy, not so much, but, but the, one of the richest guys in China, he's a, he's a real estate developer. And he always uh, gives the majority share to all his partners. Yep. He always does 51, 49s yep. or, if, or, or even more yep. imbalance. And, and somebody, again, sat down with him in an interview and said, why do you, always, yep. why do you never do 50, 50 mm-hmm. deals? Why, don't you, yep. why, why do you give mm-hmm. away the majority stake in all your partnerships? And he smiled and says, because everybody wants to do business with me. That's right. I mean, it's, it's that easy. Tons of sense. Yeah. Um, I think uh, to, to answer the question in a little bit of detail, I think you have the benefit of being out there. I think all of us have the benefit of being out there today. And I think all of us, whether your audience, and we've, we've been at audience sizes of just starting to mm-hmm. where we are today, mm-hmm. whether your audience is very large or quite small, there are always a small group of people that are attracted to your message. And I think what I would do in this scenario is if you're looking to hire that first person, I would look very hard at the people that are engaging with your content on social and start there. I'm a very big believer on that because I think it's quite practical. They've already been Mm self-selected. They're using their free time to comment on your stuff, consume your stuff, and buy those coloring books. And so I I think that's a very important place. I've had enormous amounts of success with Wine Library and both VaynerMedia in the exact same way. They have a passion for you and your work. That's right. And by the way, and by the way, by the way, sometimes you lose because they had a vision of what they were attracted to and then the reality is it's work or this and that. Yeah. But, but I, I do like that starting point from a practical nature. Um, JJ? JJ. Hey Gary, it is JJ at 97.9 The Box in Houston. Had a blast having you on my show earlier this year to talk about your new book, Ask Gary V. Uh, I read the book. It is amazing. I got a lot of good stuff from it. I've been sharing it with some of my interns and my friends and coworkers. So thank you so much. Uh, today, I have a question for you. I'm releasing a book next month. It's called Without Bruises, A Journey to Hope, Help, and Healing. It's telling my personal story of being in a relationship with a sociopath and, you know, going through mental and emotional abuse. Well, I am trying to figure out, do I stick with JJ, who is the radio personality, to market this book? Or do I need to stay away? Because I feel like I can reach a bigger audience, but I'm not sure if that audience is really ready for the girl with the shaved hair, tattoos, who's at the hip hop station. So maybe you can give me some advice on that. Thanks, Gary, love you. I'll take this one first and then you jump in, Simon. JJ, look, the bottom line is, it's not 1984 anymore. It's 2016. The, you're not gonna hide from who you are. People are gonna figure out you have a shaved head and tattoos. Yeah. You can go under a pseudo name, you can go in disguises. They're going to figure out who you are. So yeah. I think everybody wins when they go all in. Listen, I, you know, I, first 60 episodes of Wine Library TV. 
I, 2006, 10 years ago, I was tempered a little bit because I was scared that the people on Wall Street and these rich people that were buying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year of wine for me would realize I loved wrestling and football and I cursed that I was jerseyed out. The truth is, the second I realized, wait a minute, if people like this show with 80% of me, what's really gonna happen? The second I went all in on me, it became a totally different outcome and really I've never looked back both in the wine industry and who I am today. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people in the marketing book world that don't love me. I I think the closer one is to me, I don't know, people, you know, there's there's a LinkedIn post right now where I saw somebody write of like why Gary Vee is really great at social media and the first comment with four likes from other people is I would want to do nothing like Gary Vee and I'm like, well, there's five people. I mean, you know, (laughs) you know, and I get it and I get it but I think what you have to take pride in, JJ, and everybody is if you can live a life where the people that know you the best Mm -hmm. like you the most, you win. I love that my assistants we would talk about India's one week as my, like the people that know more about my truth win. Like as we've gotten to know each other, yeah. we've liked each other more, that's not true. less. And that's the game. That's true. I mean, what's the definition of authenticity, right? Everybody's like trying to be authentic, but <laughs> right. nobody talks about what authenticity is. Authenticity is saying and doing the things you actually believe. And so to create divisions, one of them is inherently inauthentic. So in one of them, you're either being dishonest or you're faking it. So, uh, or you're hedging, or you're right? Hedging, right? hedging. So hedging is what. So I mean, me you off. are who you are, and you want to bring that personality. And at the end of the day, the more authentic uh, you are in all of your work, the more the people who love you for who you are will take your work and will help spread it for you. Um, those are champions. Um, but it's very hard to even uh, find champions if you're always hedging and trying to be what somebody else wants you to be. JJ, I think you've got a misread on America. I really do. People I, like you for you and they like 100%. you for your message. And especially if you're you, for example. Neither, here, neither of us, neither of us fits the role that we expect. I mean, I show up to these meetings in jeans and things and, and Gary, you know, he, he's, he's curses and he shows <laughs> these things. But, but people like us for who we are. And the people who don't like us for who we are don't invite us and that's totally fine. I also think that you've got to understand the American psyche, right? They're not going to care as much about tattoos and shaved heads and things of that nature. America forgives everything except if you're trying to deceive them. Like you can literally do anything in this country, probably outside of murder and get away with it as long as you don't try to pull one over on us, right? The presidents have proved that, the most famous people have proved that. We will forgive all day, but if you try to make us a sucker because you're trying to put one over on us, yeah. we hate that. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, be yourself. It? One more? Be Let's yourself. do it. Yeah. And it's hard to be yourself. It takes practice. It's like the self awareness thing, right? Uh huh. Let's do it. From Africa. I'm going to Africa. I love it. Hi, Gary. My name is Benjo Bimbala from Nigeria, West Africa. It's 2 16 a.m. in the morning here, and I'm grinding. I hope this gets in. Uh, my question is short and simple to you and Simon. When do you know you have the chops as a young person to start talking? when you have the results to back it, but you're not an all-time great yet. Do you start talking or do you document? Thank you. I, I think you start talking, uh, it's, it, the whole thing is a process, though so you start talking immediately. I mean, it takes a long time to become an overnight success, right? And uh, um, I think for the both of us and everybody we know that we admire and who's achieved anything, they've been at this a long time and they've Work. been talking at it. And by the way, they weren't great at the beginning. They t- took, go watch, Speak for go, watch early, <laughs> go watch early interviews of Steve Jobs, right? Early interviews of Steve Jobs are fantastic. He's terrible. And he, he actually in one of them says, I, I need to go throw up because he's so nervous about talking on camera. He's, he's terrible. And the point is, is he practices and he practices and he practices, he gets better, but he does it out loud. And I think the idea of hiding until it's perfect, it's, it's a fool's game. I think you put yourself out there, you, you, you start, you practice, you practice out loud, then you get feedback and you can, you can, you grow. You I mean, counterpunch, you, you adjust. Put, yeah, you put it out there. I, I, I would say the one thing that you may be referring to that I talk about a lot is it's tough to come out the gate at 22 and say this is the definitive thing, here's my advice. Be, I, think, I think talking to the world about your truth. About what you believe. Correct, is yes, the game. Is the game. I think what we're seeing on the internet right now, like I'm a 22 set, year old. I'm, know, a, I'm a business guru, coach guru, and yeah. I'm gonna teach you and the only business I have is you're gonna pay me 20K yeah. and I'm gonna teach you how to charge other people down the ladder 
20K to give you advice. That's the bad stuff. So, you know, your point of view on the world yeah. and like what you believe and where you come from, that's gold. Your process. That's why I talk a lot about documenting instead of creating. It's just your truth. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, there, there's no substitute for doing all, the amount of people that wait for the perfect thing yeah. and then never do anything. You know, the most beautiful thing when you're young and you think you have something to contribute is to admit that you don't know everything. Admit that you're you're learning. Yes. If you say I'm a 22 year old expert and I can help you do X, Y, and Z, you actually it's not true. You have, I mean, there's so much more to learn, and everybody knows that. Um, Every, you, everybody who is the kind of people that you, that you want, everybody, the yes. people that are attracted to that are gonna do very little for you besides some short-term dollars. Agreed, and if you say, look, I'm in this business, I'm fascinated by it, I'm growing fast, I'm learning fast, I'm still a student of this stuff, but I have this service to offer, that humility is unbelievably attractive and people wanna be a part of that because they know you're showing up to learn, not to... Simon, I don't know if you're paying attention to this, but in reverse what's happening is people are renting expensive things, like, you know, going to like, they're asking their dad to take $25,000 out in cash from the bank, putting it on a bed, taking a picture, then putting it back and the, like, just complete and utter fraud. And it pisses that's, me off. That's insane. Yeah, and, 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 and by the way, like, it's, just, it's just a non-winning game. And you only attract people who want the that worst. and that's not even who you are. The worst, the worst. Anyway, it's Simon. Probably lying, isn't it? Question of the day. Every guest gets to ask the question of the day. You get to ask them a question. You'll get hundreds of uh, data points back okay. in return that you can adjust to, okay. uh, both on Facebook and uh, YouTube. So uh, what would you like to ask the Vayner Nation? What is on your mind? What would you like to get a good solid survey in return from? Um, I want to know if, uh, whether you have your own business or work for a bigger company, I want to know, uh, do you feel loved and supported by the people around you? Do you feel that the cultures in which you work or the culture in which you're building are ones of cooperation and of trust? Or do you feel like you have to keep your guard up the whole time, you can't really trust anybody, and you definitely can't trust your boss? I want to know that. And if you are feeling supported and loved, tag that person. I think we are just not deploying enough positivity Agreed. and I think if somebody's doing that amazing thing for you, they would feel very nice when this shows up in their notifications and realize they're doing that for you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Love you pal. Wonderful, thanks a lot. Okay. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them. <laughs>